provided as well as many other so-called socio-religious schools orders is that they are trying to replicate and possibly even challenge the principles of schools that are based on religion like Roman Catholic schools, Protestant schools and say, okay, these schools have been existing for a long time uh, during the time of the British they were created to serve uh, populations. Uh, you could go to a Roman Catholic school without being a Hindu or a Muslim, it didn't matter. Uh, but nonetheless, there was the idea that this was church driven uh, and the idea of the fact that a church or a religious institution runs these things often gives uh, confidence to people uh, for some reason uh, that these people are going to provide uh, adequate or good ad uh, education. Uh, it doesn't always turn out like that, but it certainly is. It's also tied to the moral principles of religion that yes, you're, you're, you're supposed to educate. That's the point of proselytizing faiths is to propagate the faith of your belief and make it available to others, uh, not necessarily forcefully, not compulsorily, but nonetheless, uh, if you have a value system that's admirable, you believe in it, you should share it with the world, and you do that, of course, with uh, these educational institutions. Now, getting back to the uh, so ideology of the guru, how widespread is that throughout Hinduism, and are there differences um, as far as the esteem that certain branches or, or, or sects may um, provide these these gurus? For example, you know some may be looked on uh, as higher than the, you know political figures. Some may even higher. Some even divine figures. I think that uh, gurus are, you know, there's nobody who's a greater guru than the one you believe. in. If your guru is the best guru for you, then he is superior to all gurus. Other gurus may have a higher status in the public. So, for instance, uh, the Shankaracharyas of the four Shankaracharya Peets, Dwarka being one and others, may have higher veneration by the government or by politicians. But in terms of the status of the guru is tied to your guru. Your guru is the one who holds your hand and takes you across the, uh, the river of life. And so he is by definition, he, he may be totally silent. Some gurus may be not, won't even talk. Uh, and they're very powerful to you. Uh, how they communicate to you, that is not something that I can talk about, but obviously we know of people who believe in these particular gurus. And uh, I think the key idea of the guru is the capacity of the guru for his pupil, for his student. Uh, that is, the guru is somebody who can take you across the river of life in a morally sensitive, <laughs> responsible way. Uh, the fact that the Dalai Lama may be better known than another very modest uh, unknown monk, may just be an accident. Uh, that doesn't make him any lesser of a guru than the, than the Dalai Lama. The same thing with uh, Swami Narayan Maharaj. He represents uh, the, the various now branches. The branches may be led by descendants of the uh, Swami Narayan, brother-in-law, or, 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 or I can't remember what the relationship, mm -hmm. because he himself had no children, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, his uh, brother-in-law's uh, so his, son. So his brother-in-law. Yeah. So these persons are considered to have in them a residue of the divine, if not a residue, let us put it, maybe residue is not the right way, right word, maybe a portion of the divinity of, yeah. uh, of the uh, founder and therefore they are venerated not for who they are personally but what they contain and therefore they are also then 
their veneration transforms them and they have to act in a certain kind of way. They may be ordinary people with ordinary desires and other things, but those ordinary desires have to be suppressed when they are dealing and acting in the world as the leader of these particular branches. And uh, they may be less intelligent, less educated than some of their followers, but they have something that nobody else has, which is they have part of the divine or Godhead in them. Now, how, how common is that in, in Hinduism, um, you know, as compared to people who, who just see gurus as, as men who, who, who lead, um, you know, their fathers to, to, um, to moksha or, or, or spirits to guide them? Yeah. How common is it for the Hindu followers to place um, their gurus in, in, in that sort of divine realm? Is, that a, is it a common thing or is that an extraordinary thing? Uh, again, it's, it's pervasive everywhere. For instance, the followers of uh, uh, Sai Baba think of him as God. Mm. And uh, so now again, it's, it's a recognizability. I see him as a man with a fuzzy head. Or I might see the, a particular Swami uh, leader uh, to represent a certain image. Uh, but that would be looking at it from the surface. I don't see it uh, the way a devout devotee sees it. And especially a devotee whose life has been transformed. Or whether transformed or not, if the devotee believes that the person has transformed their life, then that person is something that the surface does not recognize. It's the inside value, it's the inside qualities that come manifest to me as a devotee. And it's that inside manifestation of the divine, that whatever you want to call it, effulgence, power, generosity, kindness, benevolence, uh, sympathy, those values are life uh, embracing values. If I believe that the person is doing that to me, I confer to them a higher pedestal. And uh, so it's the same argument which you could say, you know, to a non-believer that's a stone and to a believer that is that stone sculpture is not stone. To another believer that stone painted in red is just a stone painted red. To another believer, to a real, that stone is not that. It is in fact the divinity without form. One of the crucial notions is that the divinity is nirakar and nirgun. Nirakar means without form and nirgun is without quality. In other words, the normal qualities that we have, goodness, badness, uh, desire, uh, nobility, these are all attributes of human condition. But the divine is above that, he is nirgun, he is without qualities because every quality contains. By contains, it reduces. So the divinity is beyond our imagination and same thing nirakar means without form. The shape of the guru or the shape of the divine in a murti, in a human being, in a mantra, in a, a icon like a swastika, these are only ways for us to be able to grapple with something which is beyond our capacity. The divine is only being manifested through this because we can grasp that. We cannot grasp a concept that we cannot think about. So that's why the whole notion that these shapes, even the messages that are conveyed by the divine are messages of recognizability. If I go to Poland and I start talking in English or Gujarati, I'm not going to be able to communicate, will I? And therefore the gurus themselves or the preceptors speak in the language that their people can understand, their followers, their devotees, are able to uh, understand and embrace and then resonate with. So that is always the case in these, these matters. Okay.